I'm Nate Angel. Uh, I'm calling to you from Portland, Oregon today. And um, this is the kickoff session of the Open Learning Journey track at MyFest 22. Really excited uh, to kick off this track with these fine people. Um, and I'm joined here today by uh, my uh, co-lead, Rami Kalir, <laughs> who already introduced himself, but I'm going to ask him to do it one more time for the recording's sake. And then we're going to meet um, our conversants today. Rami, say hello to the folks. Hey, greetings all. Again, briefly, I'm Rami Kalir, uh, joining you from Denver, Colorado, um, also the ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Ute people. Um, I'm an associate professor at the University of Colorado, Denver, and I'm really excited to uh, join everyone in conversation today as we explore open learning and broadly contribute to the MyFest community. Good to be here. Thanks, everyone. Great. And so I'd like to um, actually um, <clears throat> have us take a moment to, before we actually um, introduce our conversants and, and get started with the program, I'd like us to just take a moment and um, spend a couple of minutes um, having a short conversation with um, someone else in your <clears throat> uh, in a breakout room actually because we're we're ending up we've got actually 18 folks here so far today and so that's that started to be quite a crowd and so i'm just going to um, send us away in pairs to breakout rooms um, uh, so for about five minutes and i have this prompt for you you don't have to answer it uh, i'm going to put it into the chat as well oops as soon as i um <clears throat> as i move it from my window um, and this is a prompt to just get us started on the idea of um, thinking about opening uh, in this track, we're thinking of opening primarily as a verb, but um, I thought it might be interesting and fun for us to get to know each other a little bit by first thinking at, of it as a, um, as a noun. Um, and so if you could look around your space right now and find an opening, it could be an opening of any kind. It could be a door, a window, it could be a small container. It could be the bottom of your coffee cup. Who knows what you'll see um, and prepare that and think about it for a minute. And then I'm going to send you all to a breakout room just for a few minutes uh, and you'll go away. You'll be randomly assigned to someone else uh, and have that conversation sharing what you, you have seen through your openings with each other. And then you'll come back and we'll start the real program. So, no, well, it's not the real program, right? This, how this many is minutes? A, how many minutes do we have? I was going to uh, send people away for, for five minutes. Does that seem right, Maha? That sounds good. Okay. So I hope everyone had a, um, a great time in their breakout rooms. And I just want to uh, mention a few other folks have joined um, in the interim. And uh, Noah gave a great answer didn't have time to go to a breakout room, but they said that, uh, I think they were looking out a window and they and they they looked out the window and they said that they saw through that window the future, which I think is a great answer. Um, <laughs> I hope you, you all found great answers as well. So um, possibly we all know each other, we know someone new or maybe we got to connect with an old friend. And so I wanna move to the next um, moment in our conversation here today which is to um, spend a little bit of time just getting to know the conversants that we've gathered here to have this conversation. And uh, it's interesting that all the conversants had, um, had last or family names that um, were at the very beginning of the alphabet. <laughs> and so I've organized them alphabetically by family name, um, but there, there wasn't, it wasn't very much of the alphabet actually. So it was, it was sort of funny to me. Um, and so I thought I'd start off by um, asking Tutelaney to um, tell us a little bit about his work with open education. Um, you can see his biography there on the screen, but um, Tutelaney, um, can you, uh, can you speak a little bit about your experience with open education and help folks understand uh, your journey in open education? Absolutely, thank you, Nate, and hello, everybody. Great to be here with you all. Um, you know, the the first, uh, rather the the organization by alphabet for me when I was in grade school always meant that I could never get away with not doing my homework. Yeah. because my teacher had a habit of going by alphabetical order um, there. So I always had to at least try to be prepared. Um, so I 
my journey through um, open education. I think my journey around open education has really been uh, much more uh, around notions of representations. Um, and, and that's sort of how I come to this, uh, even from my background in communication and media studies, ideas of um, who's not who, whose story is not being told or whose story is being told by, by whom. Um, so I got excited about open education because I thought that was uh, a way for me to center my Africanness through um, the literature that is being produced, being able to tell stories from my uh, standpoint um, and to really be able to get more people to uh, engage in representing and telling their own stories the way that they want to be uh, they want to be heard um, and I've done that through working with uh, different people around um, uh, whether it's you know I, I, I have an open access book where I work with students to write uh, based on um, what they learn in that class and they're always writing the book for the next class that comes after that and it's a continually iterative process and so on. Uh, but for me, I've always said that my uh, I come to um, the open conversation in terms of um, just um, yearning for seeing more voices that are not necessarily in established text, um, uh, rather than um, so. Let me stop there before I babble on for the, the rest of the hour. So, but thank you. Good to be with everybody. Oh, thank you so much, Tulani. Um... I also kind of approach things from media studies. And so uh, I didn't know that about you. And I'm, I'm really glad to learn that that was your path. Next up, moving to the Bs in the alphabet. Yes, we're alphabetically non-diverse here in our family names. Um, I, I also am at the, at the beginning of the alphabet. Um, Catherine Cronin has mentioned that she's never been last in any list before. So this is maybe your first time for that. So Mahabali, who's been such an amazing organizer of this, um, my fest event along with Mia Zamora who's also here um, and so many other people in this cast of thousands has put this on. Maha, would you uh, like to share a little bit about your journey uh, to open? Yeah, thanks Nate. Um, so I'll, I'll try to be quick. It's hard to be quick because it's a long journey, right? So um, my first uh, entry into open started with uh, the knowledge of open access and I first got to know about open access through piracy. When I was trying to finish my PhD at a time where I had a child at home and there was a revolution happening in Egypt and my PhD supervisor told me I have to read more about methodology and you know you, to get those like sage handbooks for qualitative research that cost I don't know how much in dollars that I couldn't afford and I couldn't go to the library because the library was closed if you guys from Egypt know 2013. Um, and so I discovered a lot of people had pirated like different chapters of things. <laughs> and so I was able to manage and I realized, oh my God, that's so valuable. And then I realized there's a legal way of doing it, but like totally the illegal way is great too. <laughs> and so it started with open access and somehow that moved into open education. And um, I was always, I did my PhD remotely. So I always was learning mostly on my own, barely had access to other um, students. But then towards the end of my PhD, I realized that on Twitter there were hashtags for PhD students like PhD chat and I think there was for social science PhDs and, the, and there was a podcast for how to prepare for your oral exams and stuff and that really made me realize that it was the communities that you could find openly that could really make a huge difference and since then I've most of my learning has been happening in the open anyone who knows me knows that and I realized that when you ask questions other people learn too it's not just about getting information from what other people post and not only giving what you know, but also asking by asking you help other people learn. And I also started to become critical of those spaces because as Tutelini said, it's really important to ask whose stories are being told, whose stories are not being told, who's telling whose stories. Because early on in my open practice, the way certain people told my story on about me made me feel really uncomfortable. And I became sort of really into doing collaborative autoethnographic research rather than research about other people and not involving them in a participatory manner. And I'll stop here for now. That's so great. Uh, I've, uh, I guess I've never even learned all the different uh, nooks and crannies in your long journey. Um, so many things have, have happened there. And every time I learn something, every time I meet you, I learn something new. 
So we're already up to the C's, A, B, C, um, and I'd like to welcome um, a person I'm meeting, I think for the first time ever, um, it seems odd, uh, but uh, maybe we've actually met live and I've forgotten about it, but I'm not sure that that's true. Um, so Matthew Cheney um, coming to us from New Hampshire, if I'm not mistaken. So Matthew, would you like to talk a little bit about your pathway to open? Thank you, Nate. Uh, similar to everybody else, it is a long journey, uh, but I will be brief. I think I'm constitutionally inclined toward openness because way back in 2003, I created a blog um, because I was teaching high school in New Hampshire and had no real community for writing. And it was just a way to get stuff out in the world. And inevitably I ended up talking about teaching as well. Um, and that got attention. And so I was, I've always sort of been talking about my teaching to the world and sharing resources, putting, uh, creating syllabi with Google Docs and just putting them out there so anybody could see them and use them. And I didn't ever have language for this. Um, to some extent, I think I was aware of open access, um, but it really wasn't until much later when um, I, I just happened to be working with my colleague, Robin DeRosa, um, whose name some of you may know. And Robin has become a big advocate for open educational resources and openness. And I thought, oh, so this is what I'm doing. Uh, and now, uh, now Robin and I work together all the time and uh, I have been able to create an intentional openness and really move that into a much more coherent um, way of thinking about scholarship and knowledge because I, I have, though I am in dear old rural New Hampshire, I have friends around the world and I want to be able to share work with them. I have friends who are academically minded, who do not have access to academic resources. Um, I want to be able to talk with them and share with them. And so contributing to and building a knowledge commons has become absolutely central to uh, how I think about the work that I do. Yeah, there's, I, I love that point about, um, you know, wanting to share with people who don't have academic access. I think about the open access issue that, that Maha brought up that brought her into open. And it's like, if you're at a, an academic institution, which maybe still has access to all sorts of academic journals and other resources, um, even I remember back in the day, email was only a thing really that academics had often, unless you were some super geek. Uh, and I just being able to open and share those academic privileges to a wider audience is so powerful. Okay, so last but not least, we've actually managed to get all the way to the end of the C's now. Um, uh, and so Catherine Cronin, uh, at the very end of the alphabet, for today at least, um, Catherine, would you like to share a little bit about your pathway to open? Absolutely. Um, thank you, everyone. What a so lovely to see you all and lovely to hear everyone's stories before me. As, as you said, Nate, you learn new things about even your good friends um, every day. So that was lovely. Um, yeah, long, crazy, uh, complex journey, but um, I suppose I started considering myself an open educator maybe in the like 2009, 2010, 2011, um, early days of, you know, um, academic Twitter and blogging and using that in my teaching. And it resonated, I, I was teaching in higher education at that stage, and it resonated with me because I did a lot of community education earlier in my career, particularly with um, women in marginalized communities. So, you know, if you give me a very rigid outline of something or lines, I'll, I'm going to try and, you know, drag those lines a little bit, or at least smudge them a bit. So open education kind of afforded that opportunity um, for, for I felt for learners to express themselves in different ways, for us to connect with people, you know, beyond the, you know, the rooms and the, the institution that we were in. Um, and, you know, very quickly, uh, again, in those days, academic Twitter was a different Twitter than it is today. So I've met, you know, a lot of people who are in this, you know, I see in this room here um, in those days. So uh, there was a lot of emboldening one another, you know, to try different things and to experiment. Um, so, you know, my entry point was what I would still call open educational practices. You know, I kind of found OER after that, but really it was all about, um, you know, opening and opening learning in ways that were meaningful 
you know, for those students um, and staff who, who who I was working with. Um, and also I should say, but before my, my original degrees were in engineering, but I did, a, I did a master's degree in women's studies. So one of the most exciting things that I found out when I began learning more about um, open pedagogy was that it does have very explicit roots in feminist pedagogy, um, which was something that um, was really important to me. So, so yeah, so that's a little bit about how I got here. I didn't uh, talk about learning something new. I had no idea that you had an engineering background. So do you consider yourself a learning engineer then? I consider myself a recovering engineer, to be honest. Yeah. That's usually how I refer to it. I know there's some debates in the community about the learning engineer versus other terms that one might use. I don't do anything explicitly engineering anymore, but uh, there's a few people in this room who I've done work with before, Maha, Mia, and they'll know that I approach thing, I approach any problem in this in kind of a, a structured way. I'm gonna, I'm gonna like try and find some kind of way to to get from here to there. Um, so yeah, a recovering engineer, Nate. This is actually an interesting topic. I see Maha uh, added to the chat, like you can't engineer learning. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe this is a tension you guys have already explored. Yes, sure. yes, yes. <laughs> Okay. Well, you know, uh, one thing I, I really, it's so great to learn about the diversity of different paths that people have taken toward open. And I'm sure everyone in this room probably has something to say about their pathway to open. Um, and we, just due to the limits of time, we can't go around the full room and do it. We've got like a, about another hour here. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to um, step back and remind us that um, this, uh, this particular gathering is uh, the first gathering in what we're calling the open learning journey, which is a track at MyFest 22. And part of the reason that we called these folks together was we wanted to kick off this whole track um, by having a conversation about what open learning means, right? What, what is open? What is learning? And we've already touched on it a little bit there in that, in that short conversation about engineering. Um, but before we, um, and one of the, sorry, let me not get ahead of myself here. One of the things that we've asked the folks who are here as conversants to do was to gather a few examples of kind of their favorite um, ideas about what open learning can, can look like. And so part of what we're going to do today is walk through those different, um, those different examples. Um, but before we do that, um, I thought it might be interesting to just have a little conversation about these terms open and learning themselves. Um, and uh, because Maha sort of um, was already starting that in chat, I'm wondering if, if Maha might wanna um, just start to respond to that idea about what is learning, can it be engineered and what is open? Mm -hmm. What do we mean by open <laughs> when we say open and open learning? I don't wanna answer the question of what is learning, but I can say why it can't be engineered. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, think, I think I'm think i gonna say this because our minister of education here in Egypt is an engineer and he tends to approach things with like, oh, if it happened like this somewhere else, then we do it like that here, it's gonna work like that. And education is not like that. And learning is not predictable that way, right? It's more complex. That's what I meant by learning cannot be engineered. Like no matter how well you think you're designing it, you can't predict the, what's gonna happen with it. Um, and open has so many meanings, but I think what Rachel said uh, reminded me of something that I didn't mention when I uh, when I was introducing myself. Uh, I worked with Suzanne Kosioglu, who's going to be um, one of the guests on Friday, I think, to create something we called self as OER, or the open self in general as a concept, right? So I think openness is a worldview and a way of being in the world. And the way Rachel reminded me of this is that when Suzanne and I were talking about this, we were talking about Having that sensibility to be open and thinking that by being open, you could both sort of heal yourself and then also help others. And I was remembering Rebecca Hogue, who is one of my closest friends. Hi, Rissa. Um, Rebecca, who's one of my closest friends and the co-founder of Virtually Connecting, which I'll talk about soon, who is a cancer survivor herself. And she was a blogger before that, but then she was also vlogging her cancer journey and how impactful that was on a lot of people, whether women who have had cancer or people who are supporting people with cancer, um, I think it was a big, big part of my cancer education, and I, I come from a family of medical doctors. It was a completely different perspective of what it means to be an engaged patient. And so I think openness, um, that kind of vulnerable openness, uh, this, this willingness to make yourself vulnerable in this way is a completely different learning experience than what you can get from formal education and books and sort of what Tutalini was saying, who's telling the story? 
of what it means to be a, a cancer patient and things like that. And I had a student this semester who was an orphan who created a game about what it means to be an orphan and grow up in an orphanage in Egypt. And people who have lived in Egypt know that this is not something people really understand and have a lot of stereotypes about. So I was just thinking about the vulnerability of, of an open sensibility and how impactful it could be. I don't really think I answered your question, but it's what I wanted to say. So <laughs> no, I, I think you did actually. I mean, just this idea of you know openness as a mindset sort of, I think is an interesting way to think about it. Um, so rather than something that one does to education, it's actually something that one brings to the world as a whole, just in maybe everything one does. Well, I don't want this to necessarily be a highly directed conversation by me alone. Um, do, do some of our other conversants have um, ideas about what Maha just said or their own thoughts about what open really means? I would say that I think of openness as an offering um, in addition to what Maha said, because that, that also opens up a vulnerability. And, uh, and I think that a lot of my journey through education has been one of letting go of the, the delusion of control. Uh, because especially as a young teacher, I really thought it was my job to control the curriculum and the students and everything. And where I have gotten to now, and I think one of the reasons why open education has been so important to me is letting go of that sense of control and, and instead saying, here is what I am and what I have to offer, who are you and what do you have to offer as well? It's an offering, it's a mindset. <laughs> yeah, and then seeing what happens. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, being open to, the, to whatever happens. Well, Catherine, you have a PhD in openness, right? <laughs> Thanks, Maha. <laughs> yeah, she outed you. Um, no, I, every, everything that uh, Maha and Matt just said resonate with me. And, and Matt, a word that I've often used is just um, about, about hum the humility of, of being open. And the paradoxical thing is that for people who are new to openness, it can seem like a very hubristic thing to do, that you're just sharing your work and blogging and getting your work out there. Whereas when you really engage with it critically, um, with you know this kind of values-based understanding about you know, equity and justice and, you know, why we want to be open, then it's the exact opposite of a hubristic thing to do. Um, you know, there's a lot of humility and um, just letting go um, in it. So, but I, I, I'm happy to leave some time for, for Tutelini as well. Um, you know, I, whenever I think about open, there's, there's one thing that has always, that sticks with me. And I think it's something that, um, you know, uh, I think Maha, you said when you presented at a, at a speaker series at uh, Oklahoma State, of, I think a few years back, and this idea like when you're opening, what are you opening? Um, and that has always stuck with me. And I think now where I am is, I guess open is complex. And I think it's really when, to kind of just play off uh, uh, Catherine's remark, when you really think about it critically, it's incredibly complex because we're dealing with issues of equity and justice, which are just not yes or no type of issues. Um, I was in a conversation earlier this week because of my work around indigenous knowledge. Um, you know, when we come to indigenous knowledge where communities don't have um, operate on issues of ownership and licensing and things like that, when you open up that knowledge that does not belong to you, now it's accessible to everybody else. Now you're introducing these issues of, um, of ownership and uh, commercialization and everything else. Um, you just, you, you put in things that just in that the, the notion of openness is so incredibly uh, complex that it requires a certain level of care um, that I'm not so sure I'm always uh, aware of. So I'm so glad that you brought that up too, because um, I think it's very easy to just celebrate openness as a, as an undeniable benefit to all, but there's some complexity there that I really think that you brought forward to Delaney that, you know, it, it, we're always speaking from positions 
Sometimes those positions include power and privilege and other kinds of things. And so openness can look very different when one is one is looking at it from a different point of view. Maha, did did you uh, did you have a reaction to that as well? Or? No, I was typing something to, to <laughs> Catherine in the chat. I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> so funny how it's very hard to do two things at once, isn't it? I find myself uh, struggling with that here in this meeting, actually. Well, uh, I think we've we've. Oh, Catherine, you unmuted. No, I, I just want to say that I, I love the way that Tojalini you, you you teased out that notion of complexity. Um, there's there's a lot there. So thanks. For sure. Well, I you know we could probably. Um, have a conversation about just the word openness and what it means all day long, especially um, if other folks that are here as participants also got involved. Um, but we did promise that we were going to um, walk through some uh, actual examples of openness. Um, and uh, we've we've got a whole bunch in our uh, in our slides. We've got some examples there that um, I think uh, different people have provided these slides um, and so might speak to them. But I think each example could maybe uh, let us start a little conversation around uh, what does open learning mean in that context of that example. Um, so if unless there's any objections, I'll um, go ahead and, and share the slides again. So um, once again, we've, I think we've actually um, added some of these in alphabetically. And so, um, but I took away everybody's uh, name. So I'm not uh, always sure exactly who added each one. I think that Maha added this, this particular example. Um, and so uh, Maha, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, why you yeah. um, brought this one forward. Yeah, so it's very funny because it came up in our breakout room today and I'd forgotten that I was going to talk about it anyway. <laughs> so I don't know how many of you know this site, uh, but this is a site that Mia Zamora, Autumn Keynes and I co-curated during the, like we started August, 2020. Um, so first of all, Equity Unbound was co-founded by Catherine Crone and Mia Zamora and myself, and it evolved into various different things just depending on what our community needed at the time. And so this was August, 2020. Basically, uh, we were in a conversation with some people where we started talking about how people who are new to online learning during the pandemic had no idea how to build community online and they thought it wasn't possible. Those of us who'd been teaching and learning online for a long time, we knew it was possible, but also usually it wasn't with the synchronous stuff that a lot of people were using. So I'm just going to put the link in the chat in case people don't know what this is, but this is a website where we came and recorded videos with people demonstrating what they would do in their class to build community and then giving adaptations and resources and templates to people and sharing that out. And um, so a lot of it is co-curated or co-created by Mia Zamora, Owen Keynes and myself. There's also resources from all kinds of people. Laura Gibbs contributed, Rissa contributed a lot of the videos, Rami Kalir. Um, I don't know who else here has contributed, but there's definitely been a lot of people doing that. And the thing about this as an open sensibility is I could be someone who's, oh, I'm a good teacher, so I'm going to teach well in my class and nobody else will know. Or my role in my institution is I'm a faculty developer, so I support people at my institution and I give them workshops. But this idea of, well, why can't everyone in the world benefit from this? Not only just as a why not, but also in the sense of recognizing that Educational development support during the pandemic was unevenly distributed, right? There's a lot of injustice there. Some instances didn't have a center for learning and teaching at all, or didn't have one that was big enough. Everyone, and everyone here who's an educational developer, I'm sure, was burnt out for the past two years by suddenly supporting an entire institution when you were supporting only a few. And the need for community building was so high because there was no social face-to-face -face in a lot of countries. And so this was, to, to us, like we were thinking that was the most, like, important thing that we needed to give to the world and to, to curate from everyone all their ideas and put them in a place where people could could benefit from them is just still growing and we hope through the community building track that people will contribute more to this uh, space does anyone who contributed to this want to just say something very quick or in the chat or orally or whatever or anyone who used it there might be people here who've used it i'd love to hear from them if we have a second to do that nate yes has anyone has anyone contributed to or used the uh, Equity Unbound community building resources? 
I'll just weigh in for a second and say that um, this is like my little treasure trove and I hope it would be for anyone else as well. So when I'm preparing for class, I just dip in and get grab a little idea. Sometimes I um, do an adaptation or a remix on the idea, but because it comes from so many people I love and respect and who share um, these open values that we've been discussing, it really is like a treasure trove you know, it just gives you that spark of an idea to move forward to um, design learning for others with, you know, in co-creation, et cetera, in effective ways. So that's my small comment on it. And I see uh, folks already chiming in the chat about, um, about people who have used them uh, in their work. Uh, Jennifer, uh, did you want to say a little bit more about what you, you gave it quite an extensive chat message there about your use? Yeah, um, this has just been really helpful. I, I stumbled on it when I was thinking about um, community building activities, you know, for adults. My background is K-12 education. I teach in teacher education in a post-baccalaureate program. Um, and I'm using this model. Um, I'm trying out this model this summer in my courses using the Castle SEL three signature practices, which is a uh, model for social emotional learning and that has been really paramount in the pre-k through 12th grade um, world right now um, and their model really uh, encourages teachers to think about um, a learning experience so it could be a, a lesson a daily lesson it could be a week lesson but framing it through this sel lens with welcoming inclusion activities then thinking about you know engaging strategies um, in addition to, you know, how are we going to provide brain breaks and transitions that are um, that are practical, but also supportive, and then um, uh, ending with optimistic closure. So this site has been just really invaluable in being able to bring um, those community building activities and the welcoming inclusion part of my classes. I um, mean, they've really they've really enjoyed it, and I've noticed that there's just been a a much quicker bonding in my classes because of it. Well, that's great. And there are so many other people chiming in and chat too about, about their value that they've gotten from these resources. I, I, I think the whole community is thankful for all the, everybody who contributed putting this collection together. And I understand it can keep growing, right? So we can all, we can all be contributing more, more to it. Um, I would bring up more folks to talk about this, but um, I also, you know, know that we have some other examples, and so there will be other chances uh, for for folks to converse. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next uh, the next shared example, which I think um, was also from Maha. Did you want to speak to this one, Maha? Yeah, so this is co-edited with Catherine Cronin. As you can see, the second name, not the last name. <laughs> this is alphabetical order, I think, too. And Laura Chernovich from South Africa, Robin DeRosa, who's Matthew's uh, colleague, and Rajiv Jangani in Canada. Um, and so this book, uh, I think Rajiv is, and Robin reached out to us saying, you know, we want to create a book that's only talking about the marginal perspectives on open education not because when you what was happening with open education is that there were some dominant views from primarily white men about open education and people who tried to bring in diverse views would bring in those views in the midst of all the dominant views and they would get swallowed up by the dominant views because people are so used to them um and so yes thank you for the link um and so we were like you know what everyone who contributes to this book is marginal in some way or at least representing a critical social justice or marginalized perspective on open education. And so every contribution in this book is like, if you want to immerse yourself in thinking about open education in, the, in a different way, this book is, is the one for you. And a lot of what's in it, almost everything that's in it, we decided would not be peer reviewed stuff because the peer reviewed stuff you can find in journals and it's probably reaching academics and so on. These are mostly blog posts and videos and and all kinds of other contributions. And Tutelini, I think it has the last chapter in the book. Um, yeah, so for, for us, it was just design at the margins, for the margins, you know? Yeah, and I'll just point out that um, this first week of the Open Learning Journey track here at MyFest was in a way sort of inspired by this book. And we tried to gather quite a few people who contributed it, to it at the different sessions. Um, uh, for for this track, so we encourage everybody to go look at it. To Delaney, um, would would you want to weigh in here and talk a little bit about your 
experience and contribution to open at the margins? I, I think um, I, I try to touch on that a bit in my introduction. And I think this is where in that chapter is where I sort of uh, outline a bit about how I came to uh, open education. And it was my reflection on um, uh, the open ed conference that I went to once and I was uh, on the planning committee and I realized from there that I think I was having a different perspective than some of my colleagues about how they were coming to the conversation, which was around uh, open textbooks and free educational resources, which I value, but it just wasn't what where I was positioned. Uh, and the argument that I, uh, I often make is that, um, you know, the same people um, some of the same people who would write text about, um, let me just personalize it, uh, as Africans have no knowledge, no contribution to civilization and anything else in a, in a for-profit book, are also the same one now who can write the same exact um, textbook that's open. Um, so if we limit openness to simply cost issues, there are some issues around equity and justice that we just won't resolve. Um, so that that's sort of what I was trying to get at in that in that chapter that um, there's also yeah saving money for our students is, is of great importance because higher education, especially in the US context is extremely expensive. Um, but there's also other issues around open that I think we need to look at as well. Um, and that's what uh, um, I was looking at but um, again, this is this is such a great collection of, of, of work and maybe I'm just being biased because I'm in it, but I think there's a lot of really great, uh, everything in there, every chapter there is a really uh, great contribution. It was a great um, book to read and be part of. Yes, Matthew, such... did you want to say something? I agree with oh, you. Ahead. Sorry, Nate. Uh, I'm no, so agreeing ahead. with the part about, I think sort of, I was writing in the chat, openness is not necessarily the highest value in every context, right? Like sometimes people, oh, open, that's the most important thing, and then forget about everything else. But almost everyone in this book is giving you a different perspective on that, and and definitely not open as just textbooks and cost and all of that. Um, I was wondering if Catherine also wanted to say something about the process of this book or... Uh, and yeah, we were always I mean, hoping it would continue, you know. <laughs> yes, I mean, I, I, I don't. I want. I love. I love hearing from uh, voices of everyone who's here. But the only thing I might add is that you know we were really clear at the end. We were clear about our process and um, non-dominant voices and locations and all and you know all of those important aspects. But also that this isn't this isn't the volume you know that it's you know it's it's published as a volume but we we, we it's very much open to you know anyone who finds this useful we extend the invitation to you know publish something similar extend it you know this only goes to 2020 uh, there's been so much great work published since then so you know i hope that you know for people who have been inspired by it and used it that you know it might inspire further work you know in a similar vein Yeah, it's such a such a rich book. I found myself going in it and it was like a rabbit hole because it was like each uh, each article unfolded and brought you to something else. And then that would unfold to bring you to something else. And so there was like a constant flowering of of new experiences in it. Well, in the interest of time, we'll have more time for discussion, um, but I want to make sure that we actually visit all the examples that that folks have gathered. So um, I'm going to move to the next one here. And this, can we skip uh, this one? Can we skip this sure. one and move to someone else and come back to it later? Yeah. Uh, sure. So um, this, I believe, was contributed by Matthew. Yes, indeed. Want to uh, talk about this example? Sure. So I was thinking, for examples for this, I wanted to think a little bit beyond tools and more toward attitudes and values um, because that's important to me because tools especially online tools change so quickly um, so i started with um, my own home base uh, which is what i know best and that is uh, our open learning and teaching collaborative at plymouth state university and this is the the website that that we built together but really fundamentally was built by uh, my colleague martha burtis um, and it allowed us to really have a hub for our work and to share our work with the world in, in whatever form it may be. Uh, it also allowed me to take all the various uh, 
open items that I had for my classes, particularly syllabi, but assignments, those sorts of things, and put them all into one spot um, for our classes. I'm director of interdisciplinary studies for the university, and that's a program for students to create their own majors. And it lives um, perhaps uniquely uh, within our learning and teaching center, because we think of it as the place where we experiment on students uh, when we experiment on teachers uh, with all of our other work. Um, so it's an opportunity for us to then have a curricular part of our learning and teaching um, program. And it also, this website allows me to share with the world and with our students in a, as accessible a means as we can possibly imagine um, the things that we are, are doing. Uh, there's also there within some of, you can see the Design Forward program, which we're just creating now. Uh, which is part of our faculty development, but also a basic element part of our ethos is that um, we should always be trying to bring students into faculty spaces and faculty into student spaces uh, and staff as well, so that we can break down some of these often very strong borders uh, within academia. Um, so by making our work open, we've been able to do this in a, in a lot of different ways. So if you can go to the next slide, Nate, um, one of the, the pieces here is a um, textbook, or I often think of it just as a web resource uh, that has existed almost for 10 years now. Um, but this is sort of the latest version of it. One of the nice things about working openly is that you can make new versions. And so our old uh, textbook, which had been used for a different course, had lots of useful things for us, but as our curriculum changed, the book need, needed to change and it would give us a nice opportunity to really weed um, what had become a kind of rhizomatic um, body of, of work of all sorts of, uh, of different types that it becomes kind of hard to navigate to see what was valuable and what was not. So we started again uh, and are, are in the midst of, we just rolled it out this past spring. Um, so this is very much a work in progress, um, but a way to bring students into the learning and um, also to share that kind of learning and ideas uh, with the world. And so one of the things that's going to be coming into it is I, I'm going to be bringing in a section of writings from students in my senior seminar course that are aimed at students who are not yet seniors. So it'll be called something like uh, Senior Voices as a way for our students who have themselves built up knowledge um, and really developed a certain expertise to then share that with other students um, within our program and, and hopefully um, beyond. Uh, finally, if we'll go to the, the last slide, Nate, um, I wanted to think about this within open scholarship because I, um, I feel like we've, we've got the, the learning and teaching part is going okay. And uh, the openness there is really has been really valuable. And now I'm really thinking a lot about the place of open scholarship, particularly within our world. I'm lucky enough to have a book coming out in the fall from Punctum Books, which is a fully open access publisher in California. And I'm, I'm very excited about this, especially because I just love Punctum's publishing model so much. And it is one that really is committed and, and not just in a sort of, oh, yes, we'll, we'll slap an open license on this shore, um, but really is committed to an active and activist vision of open access uh, and and diamond open access, as they say, not just um, something that somebody has to pay to have access to, whether pay as the author or or pay as the reader. Um, and so I've also been thinking about open scholarship on Twitter. Um, they, I just stuck up a, a list of, oh, and Catherine's on there, <laughs> um, a list of just some people you followed because the, the um, world of, of Twitter has been so powerful for so many of us, despite Twitter's many flaws. Um, it has been such a great way for, for people to connect with each other of, of different ideas. Again, I've, I've um, am thinking about my blog, which has been a way to connect to things I publish, but also then bring in things other people have written and thought about. And so we create this whole ecosystem. And I think an ecological thinking about, about openness is a valuable one because it's, it's not about any one person or one open tool or one open idea, but really the different synergies and ways that 
that we work together and build off of each other to create something that that is far stronger than any one of us and something I think really necessary in, in the world that we are currently in um, a world of of concerning trends toward a, a certain nativism and individualism and even outright fascism that I think, for me at least, openness stands in opposition to. Um, so my last piece is really for anybody who links to the, um, who has, has the link to the uh, slides, because that will give you links to all sorts of different stuff that sort of we've done in the collab, um, uh, but also some of the things that I was talking about there. Great, and we'll share out that link to the slides again so people can get to this rich bibliography, I guess one might even call it. Um, and actually, I will uh, say that one thing that um, <clears throat> that uh, Ramey and I have been uh, anticipating for this uh, open learning journey track is to um, uh, kind of collect an ongoing bibliography of all the references that people have made as we move along. And so we'll we'll make sure to include this stuff as well um you know we've we've heard we've heard a, from mahan we've heard from matthew but i'm wondering let's just if we would take a quick pause here i'm wondering um if anyone had any one of our conversants has any kind of reactions to the directions that we've we've taken the the examples so far i think the, um what what is bouncing around in my head is um uh, Matthew, your, your usage of the term ecology, um, and I and I think the idea of an openness ecology sort of has my mind, my, my head bouncing around a bit, um, and because I think there's, um, you know, there's a, there's a an implication of varied um, perspective and variety and interconnectedness in, 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 in an ecology. So I think that's sort of what I was um, hearing then. I didn't know if you maybe um, have any more to reflect on that, on that notion of ecology. Sure. Um, I, I think of ecology as metaphor primarily, but also as reality, uh, given the reality of our world. But I think metaphorically, it's a matter of those interconnections. It's a matter of the, of all of our interbeing you know, and bringing things together um, because I'm trying to think of the, the uh, there are so many different ways to go with this, but I will say one of the things that I see so often is certain areas get privileged and, and working at a, at a regional state university in the state in the US that funds higher education the least, uh, I am very sensitive to the ways that the, the rich and famous schools um, dominate conversations. And yet the conversations that I have benefited from so often have been ones at those margins, uh, outside of those uh, large and wealthy places. And um, so I really think about what are the connections that we can create also within you know, the idea of the undercommons, um, Fred Moten's idea. Um, of what is the network, what is the ecology of the undercommons, um, and how is that able to strengthen itself uh, in, a, in, an, in a way that allows the kind of work that we want to do. I know I'm not being especially eloquent on this, um, but really that is, it is all about the connections and the ways that we don't have to be individuals, that we can learn from each other, uh, and be stronger together. It, you're introducing all these terms, Matthew, <laughs> I, that are bouncing around our heads. And now, now we're all like under commons. What's that? I love that word. I'll get some links. <laughs> OK. He's going to share links. Tutelaney, is, is the ecology still bouncing around in your head? It is, but now he introduced some more stuff. Now my head is just going all, all over the place. So, but no, thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Well, maybe... I'm just going to mention that a lot of these, these, these ideas really resonate with, uh, with um, a, a lot of the work that's um, going to be part of Higher Education for Good, Teaching and Learning Futures, which um, is a book that Laura Chernuich and I are currently um, co-editing. 
So this notion of the commons and the undercommons and ecosystems and so on, it's just some really exciting work in there. So it's gonna be published at the beginning of 2023, but it's coming. Just adding a link back to the slides there for anybody who's come late, come later. Well, on that note, as long as you're, um, as long as you're unmuted, Catherine, <laughs> <laughs> should we take a look at some of the examples that you provided? Sure. Um, this was a struggle because I mean, there's, I mean, what do you choose? And um, so, uh, I, I chose two examples. Uh, this is the first. And this is this is like an older example. This is like from 2013 or 14, but it just it's just kind of like that notion of showing your work. Um, so you know, on my path to being becoming an open educator. Um, the reason I'm sharing this is because um, so many conversations, particularly in the last two years, I found here in Ireland at least, people are really wanting to talk about authentic assessment. You know, we made this this move online and so on, and. I've, I've asked so many people to dive into the work of open assessment because that's what open assessment is all about. You know, if you look at any open educator who is inviting their students to work in the open, um, they are doing that to facilitate authentic assessment. And so this is just an example, a snapshot. I think I, 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 I think I put the link in the notes, apologies for that, but if you have the link to the PowerPoint, you'll have the link. This is uh, briefly, uh, a module I was um, teaching called Professional Skills. It was in the Bachelor of Science in Information Technology curriculum. And uh, it's a one semester course. And I, so I it was about communicating and sharing ideas effectively. So at this, this was for the final project. So at this stage, as we approach the end of the semester, we had already talked about digital identity, privacy, the open web. Um, I invited the students to think about social media ecosystems rather than tools. So, you know, we just jumped into different things. We jumped into Google Plus at that time. We bumped it, bumped, jumped into Twitter, you know, Facebook, whatever um, social media ecosystems, as I said, they wanted to explore just to see how people communicated, what the norms were, you know, uh, how to be heard, how to listen and so on, because knowing that tools will always change. Um, we, ha um, we had also learned about open licensing and the students had done a previous um, assignment where they created presentations and they both used openly licensed images and then openly licensed their presentations um, because we were involved in a network of, uh, with other educators sharing work across different countries. That's another conversation. So when it came to the final project, it was a digital media assignment. And basically I, I invited the students, the only requirement was one thing and that they created um, digital media uh, for an audience or a group that was meaningful to the, for them, you know, outside the realm of our class uh, in the university. So students really connected with things like, you know, music, sport, the dance society, uh, the Society for the Protection of Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, local history, whatever they were interested in. And then I, I also said that they could choose whatever form of digital media they wanted. So this was one group activity. I love this photograph because I asked, what would you like to create, knowing that your digital media could be in any form? Because again, some of some assignments like this, people will say, okay, we're gonna do this presentation and we're gonna do this um, assignment and you have to create a video or you have to create a podcast or you have to. So I just said, it can be anything. Uh, what would you like? So a bunch of people wanted to create blogs. You can see that on the left. Someone wanted to create a tutorial and that person on the right there who I just thank still said, I have no idea. Um, probably because no one had ever asked them that before. You know, what would you like to create? What are you kidding me? I, and someone else, uh, some other student said, but didn't write on their post-it, what do you want? Which was such a revealing comment, you know, so used to producing assessment for, you know, what's the criteria? What do you want? So this, all of this work is such a learning process, both for ourselves and for our students as, as probably you, you know, any of you who are open educators already know. So, so revealing for me about different assumptions that I had um, and for students, you know, whose class before my class and after my class might be very rigid, particularly, you know, in an information technology curriculum. So it's all very well and good for me to say, oh, I'm going to do this very open uh, way of teaching um, and learning. But, you know, a lot of scaffolding and 
um, different processes are required uh, so that students feel comfortable and only as open as they wish to be. And I never required students themselves to be open or to be open on Twitter, um, but the class was open so that we could I could always model openness um, and students could see how that worked. So, uh, you know, I don't know if anybody else has made those connections between authentic assessment and open assessment. To me, it's really, really clear. I'd love to hear, um, you know, from anybody else in the group. Speakers or participants, anybody? Um, I kind of did a similar assignment like this. Uh, I was teaching social psychology last semester. And um, I told them they had to make, as a group, they had six groups in the class. And each group had to make some project on a topic in social psychology for a particular target audience that they felt they learned about. And they could share that knowledge with this particular group to help them. And I said, you can make it in whatever format you want. I don't care, okay? It just has to be able to be disseminated to the target audience that you picked. There were six groups, five of them did Instagram campaigns. <laughs> and the sixth group did a, uh, a podcast. And so while they were doing their projects, they felt like the Instagram campaigns are really great and they were putting out good information. And then at the end, I had them evaluate themselves and how they thought their project people who did Instagram campaigns at the end felt very like dissatisfied with the medium of communication that they had chosen. <laughs> I was like, well, why did you pick it? And they're like, well, everybody uses it. So like they didn't really think of any other way that they could communicate information to people. I don't know. What valuable learning. I mean, what amazing. Um, you know, that, that's the first thing that, that strikes me. <laughs> <laughs> I was really happy with their campaigns, but they, they all said they wanted to do it bigger. They wanted to reach more people, which I was happy with too, but, <laughs> but they didn't know how to. Um, yeah, that's very, that's fascinating. And yeah, I mean, there's a lot, there's so much that's learned here. And, and, I, and perhaps you found as well, Hadia, that, you know, the students were really invested because they were, you know, so much of it was their choice, you know, and it was in their own voice and so on. And we, um, I'm not really a fan of rubrics, but because there was so much choice in this topic, we, I should also mention that we collectively created, the class created a rubric by which, you know, any digital media product in any format would be assessed. You know, and it was all about communicating and clarity and structure and audience and so on. So um, I don't want to take too, too much time, but again, if anybody is really thinking about, um, you know, open assessment or authentic assessment, there's a treasure trove of open assessment ideas, you know, out there in some of the collections that have already been shared. Um, and it's a great place to, to look and to refer your colleagues, because again, it's, it's the silos that that we get so frustrated by, you know, when someone talks about authentic assessment, they might not think to look at open pedagogy or open assessment, but, you know, there are so many connections. So is that okay, Nate? I, um, I saw Maha unmuted, but um, oh, yeah, you do have a, more examples to share. Did you want to say something, Maha? Uh, no, I was just going to tell Hadil I wanted to contribute this assignment to the Digital Literacy Toolkit, which I put the wrong link to in the chat, so I'm just going to get there. And there's a session about that tomorrow. I was that just kind typing for you to share it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the second example is really recent and, again, is more just about it's not quite open teaching and it's not quite um, you know, traditional open publishing, but it's an, I think it's a good example of um, open collaborative practice, which involves an open publication. Um, and that is just on the left hand side is an image and, and a link to a guide that I was um, part of developing and part of as part of my work for the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning uh, in Higher Education in Ireland. And it was a two year project. Uh, COVID happened in there, so it was longer than we anticipated students and staff working together to define what an enabling policy is, which includes being intentionally equitable, a, a definition that we borrowed from virtually connecting. <laughs> um, so we, 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 our definition of enabling uh, covers the, the, the 
product, you know, what the policy text is, as well as the process. Um, and then we also have seven case studies in there from, from Irish HE institutions and international um, in, in good examples of digital and open policies that are enabling. Um, so we've produced this, but because it was very open, the process of developing it, the process of sharing it, the fact that it has a CC BY license, um, other people noticed it and there was some discussions going around about um, developing guidelines for open education policies. So I joined 11 other um, scholars from all over, you know, 10 different countries. Um, and we submitted a policy brief based on this guide, but we, we made it globally um, relevant um, to UNESCO. And we presented it at the World Higher Education Conference in April, and it's gonna be published as a UNESCO policy brief. So, you know, that doesn't happen if we're just, you know, developing things within our, within our, um, you know, silos and our institutions and our sectors, and then, you know, just sharing it there. So it's just, I think it's just one simple but powerful example of, of open practice. Um, and that, you know, it made the work better um, by making it, you know, global um, and multi-authored. You know, Catherine, um, having just um, moved over to work with Creative Commons, one of the things that I've really come to understand is how important it is to have policy be part of the infrastructure that we all bring to um, change we want to make um, because you know everybody does fantastic work but if it mm -hmm. just continues to land in an environment where institutions and governments and and cultures don't support it um, yeah. then then it can maybe fizzle out rather than grow and it seems like policy is a great tool to try to advance um, you know, practices and, and, and culture that we'd like to see happen more. Absolutely, Nate. And I'll tell you a little secret. And that is that um, I was sharing with Hadil earlier that I, you know, who's doing her PhD at the moment, that I did mine kind of much later in my career as well, between 2013, I finished in 2018. And it was in the area of policy and the reason, not in the area of policy, it was because I wanted to inform policy. The reason I did my PhD in open educational practices at that time was because I had been an active open educator for several years at that stage um, and was really frustrated by just that, that I knew that there was exciting work happening in you know, classes that I was a part of and other places, but that you know, the minute, you know, the, if I wasn't teaching like that in the department of IT, it would just be like taking your hand out of a bucket of water. You know, no one would miss that work. No one would ask for that work to happen. And that unless it was embedded in the strategy and policy of the institution, um, that there was no way that that, that work, you know, there would be a commitment, um, you know, to open and to equity as we understand it in open. So, you know, that's why I did my PhD in that area and then was able to go to work for the National Forum following my PhD and do this work. So it's really meaningful for me. Um, and, I, and I agree with you. I think it's really important. Did you see the uh, in the chat? Nicola just posed the question. How do you get people to see the intention of policy as supportive rather than policing? Nicola, that's a great question. And it's actually <laughs> we have there's 15 criteria for enabling policies. And that's one of the 15 is that it's the it's supportive and flexible rather than legalistic and prohibitive language. <laughs> um, so hopefully we make a case in these guides uh, for why that's important. But literally the 15 criteria of enabling policies include that as one of like it's like a checklist um so a rubric I, I if you will <laughs> it's not a rubric <laughs> no not a rubric no more rubrics um, well i know that we're we're creeping close to the end of the time um do you want to share your last example and then we can maybe have a little bit more discussion to sure end with my last example is not an example <laughs> <laughs> um uh, I, I think I, I just wanted to end. I do want to have time for discussion. I, I just wanted to end because I wanted to say that I always find hope and this notion of gritty, realistic, you know, the acts of hope in the community of open educators. And it's why I, I do this work. So, you know, I could have had many images here. I put it's Pride Month. So Harvey Milk is there in the upper left and the lower left is my square for the FEMED Tech Quilt. Um, and there's a few other images there, but you know, hope hope is difficult, particularly in these times. Um, 
but I think it's essential. And, you know, it's, I'm so grateful to work with kind of clear eyed, committed um, educators like all of you. Um, and, you know, it's why, it's why I love doing this work. I think it's important. And, you know, um, I think the only way to do it is to do it together. So just wanted to end on a note of hope. Thank you. So great. I'm thinking of hope and with hope and policy. <laughs> Maybe we can make the world go round. Other conversants were thinking about ending on a note of hope. Ramy, I know you you haven't had a chance to say very much. It's fine. I've just been like soaking it in and I don't want to, you know, kind of ho hog the mic or the discourse here. Um, given the time, actually, it would be lovely to open up to if folks who are attending. Uh, and who have questions or their own provocations or their own wonderings for our, our conversants. Um, if folks want to either post those questions in the chat, or if you do want to unmute um, and ask, this would be a lovely time to, to bring your curiosities into the conversation. I had a thought. I was kind of talking about this with um, some of the colleagues in my cohort the other day. We were talking about um, our kids and the way that they teach themselves things these days and how it's totally normal for them to like hop on YouTube and just teach themselves whatever they want to learn and find books that they want to read online for free through whatever various means there are and I'm just thinking um like we're doing a lot of work you know you guys are talking about like the, the silos that we're that we're building these programs in we're doing a lot of work in an academic setting, but I really wonder like long-term way down the line, if there's going to be like a shift in people just naturally gravitating towards other open access forms of education rather than going the university route because it's seen as like, you know, the expected route of, you know, you graduate high school, you go to college, you get a degree and you know, you become a grown up. So I don't know, I'd be interested to hear what you all have to think about that. Can I go very quickly? Um, when, when MOOCs first came out in, okay, so MOOCs existed before 2012, but you know, in front of the world, they seem to have come out in 2012 because Harvard and so on started doing them. So MOOCs are massive open online courses that anyone can take. And people started saying, is it gonna be the end of open, the end of education and higher education because these things existed. And I think for me, the, the key thing that you don't get from open learning is the social and cultural capital of being in the world offline. I think you can develop a lot of digital social capital. So you can be very good at being online. So if, if the rest of your world is going to be online and you learn everything in these open ways, it's a great way for learning. You may learn a lot more than you would learn if you go to college. You have a lot, a lot more agency over what you learn, when you learn, with whom you learn. You have much more freedom to do that. Uh, of course, not everyone, because not everyone has good internet, not everyone has internet or electricity at all. But for those of us who do, I think it can be very empowering. But then this other element, I noticed when students came back from being online for two years, they were missing those social skills of how to be with other people. So those things are really the things you get from college that you can't get, I think, from learning online. I have a lot, a lot of people here in this room are very close friends of mine, some of whom I have never met in person, and some of whom I have, and when we meet in person, we know each other well. Uh, but it's it's still a different thing as an adult to do that uh, than to than that social element. Of, that's what I think is what higher education's value statement is going to be, and and then the people who have the money will get that, and the ones who don't may do something else where they learn, but they don't develop the other stuff that helps them progress. You know, social mobility and and all that. That's what I think. But I don't know what others think. I like that we can be a little comfortable with silence in this conversation as in addition to all the talking. Matthew or Tulaney, did you have some, some final thoughts as we bring this to a close? Well, I had just put in the chat and, and we'll say here that I think the machineries of prestige are not open um, and elitism requires closedness uh, for it to perpetuate its elite and wealthy status. Uh, and uh, I see that often uh, as especially someone working from a school that has very little prestige um, and is next to schools that have some of the most in the world. 
uh, and seeing the ways that that, that that plays out only encourages me to open things further. Trying to um, um, talk and read at the same time, which is proving to be a, <laughs> a significant challenge. Um, you know, I, I think there's another aspect of freedom and choice that accompanies uh, all these different options we have, whether it's about uh, openness or different innovations and things like that. So I don't, um, I, I think, you know, for me, what open does is provide us some freedom and some choices that not everybody necessarily has. Um, I'm, I have a tough time with dualities um, in that it's not either this or that. Um, I think there are going to be some people who um, might get value out of just of doing it one way versus that. I think one of the one of the reason that MOOCs didn't succeed um, the way that I think early evangelists were advocating for, I think, is because some people kind of misunderstood. Um, people were engaging in MOOCs because um, often the people who are engaging in MOOCs are people who already had their degrees, right? Um, and at at the beginning of that research, I was I was involved in a lot of uh, MOOCs research when I was at Penn State, and one of the things that we we're looking at was this idea of completion rate. People are like, oh no, people are dropping out and everything else. Um, and the example that I used to give is that look, if I am participating in a MOOC on car mechanics and all I want to know is how to change my oil and that's in module one I, that's what I needed and I'm done um, but that will count as me failing in that in that space but what I liked about that is because I have a choice now of being able to go in and say okay I can go in and do what I need to do at this specific space and leave and go over to something else and everything else so I think it's really about this idea of providing more freedom, more choices for people um, that I think these spaces allows us. Um, and I'm, I'm not so sure if uh, that is valued as much as it should be. Hmm. That's steep. <laughs> now I'm thinking again. Uh, now my brain is going around. Well, I do realize that we've actually hit our assigned um, time to be done. And I, I want to be respectful to everyone's time. And I'm sure that there are people who need to move on and, and go to other things in their day. But I, I really want to thank everyone who came, um, our conversants and the other participants, um, because there was so much deep sharing here today. Um, I, I'm gonna, we can, we don't have to leave the room, but anybody who needs to leave the room now, probably should uh, feel free to go. <laughs> uh, we it, 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 there's no rudeness and just taking off if you need to be at your next meeting. Um, I won't, I won't completely shut things down yet, though, in case there are other things that people want to say that will still be captured in the recording. I see lots of folks are needing to take off and are doing so. Tulani, Catherine. Maha, Matthew, thank you so much for contributing to the discussion today. It was, uh, you know, it was even more fantastic than you. I imagined. <laughs> I'll also just call attention to the um, link that uh, Maha shared in the chat. If you do have time to uh, to share a very quick reflection on the. Um, your experience here today, that would be awesome. You know, my fest is, is a completely new experiment. And so um, we're trying to learn as we go. We're, we're trying to do things differently than a lot of professional summer professional or uh, mid-year professional development happens. And so um, we'd love to learn, you know, what's working for people and maybe what's not. Um, so if you have time to uh, to fill that out, here's another different, differently formatted link to that same uh, moment for reflection, very short. Other thoughts or ideas before we uh, close it out? I had a really pragmatic question, which maybe we could bring forward to the next session on um, open, um, which is what, what I would love to hear about the difference between Pressbooks, uh, Rebus, and Punctum. 
I know it's really stupid, like kind of boring, pragmatic question, but I'm really curious about it. So, but I don't want to, you know, maybe later. <laughs> well, you're, you're in luck. You're in luck, Mia, because I like week that two, too. week two of the open learning journey, which is next week, um, okay. is actually going to be focused primarily on tools. All the um, okay. sessions aren't set up yet, but keep your eye on things. I know that we have one with press books. We have one with ed, ed, uh, ed tech books. Um, I don't know that punctum will be there, um, but uh, can certainly uh, might get a chance to invite them. Maybe they can come to something. So the tools, tools and exploration of tools and, and platforms is next week's topic. Awesome. And thanks for bringing up the idea of plugging the rest of it. Um, this has been a somewhat emergent uh, uh, thread or uh, track, sorry. And so um, a lot of a lot of the um, sessions are be, still being scheduled. And so it's a live, it's an organic living um, experience. And so uh, don't be afraid to check back in with the, um, you know, the, the MyFest site and the various ways that you can see what sessions are happening because uh, new ones are popping up like, like mushrooms after a spring rain. Folks, I got to run, um, but this was so lovely just because, uh, you know, so many of our conversations are honored. Thank you so much for really inspiring us as we kick off this journey. As Nate mentioned, it's very emergent. There's a lot of moving pieces, but you provided us with a really inspiring kind of high level, really complex introduction. And so just thanks again for setting the tone for what I hope will be a really uh, meaningful experience for MyFest participants moving forward. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.